Hello everyone and thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Today's presentation is going to be an overview and review of two Belarusian red dot or collimator style optics. The PK-01VS and the PKA Venezuela. These gear reviews have not been doing super well on my channel so I might move away from this kind of stuff in the future but for now I find it interesting and I hope a couple of you out there will find it interesting as well. I've been running both of these particular sites for about 18 months now, and I feel like I'm at a point where I can offer a generally realistic assessment of how these products perform, especially when compared to more conventional or at least familiar Western style products. Last time I checked, there are not a ton of English speaking reviews on these Belarusian collimators. So hopefully this video helps at least a few folks out there get a clearer picture of how these optics perform. So let's start this presentation by saying a couple words about the manufacturer of these optics, which is the Belomo Corporation of Belarus. While not necessarily a well-known brand among North Americans like myself, Belomo is actually a quite large and well-established manufacturer in the European market. They make a host of consumer and commercial goods, ranging from countertop food dehydrators to air brakes for semi-trucks. However, they're most known for optical targeting solutions for commercial and military customers. In addition to producing magnified scopes for sporting purposes, they make serious military hardware, ranging from small arms optics, such as what we're talking about today, and thermal imagers for attack helicopters. Belomo is estimated to control roughly 2% of the global optics market, including 10% of the Russian market, which is obviously pretty significant and segues us into a brief disclaimer. For anyone who may not be aware, the nation of Belarus, at least certainly under the regime of Alexander Lukashenko, is a close ally to the Russian Federation. I'm not an economist or a politician, but I know that Belomo was born under the Soviet military industrial complex, and I assume that Belomo still falls under the larger Russian umbrella in terms of military sustainment. This is not something I was thinking about when I did business with them back in 2020, but this is absolutely something to be considering in spring of 22. It should be noted that the United States government did uh, additionally sanction Belomo from 2011 to 2013, alleging that they had violated multilateral export control lists and transferred sensitive military technology to Iran, North Korea, and Syria. This is not something I was aware of when I did business with them, but perhaps I should have been. Make no mistake, I'm not here to tell you who you should and shouldn't give money to. I didn't create this channel to help viewers unpack their own moral code or promote my own political agenda. I encourage viewers to live in accordance with your own ethical values, but at the end of the day, you alone are accountable for how you choose to navigate this world in which we live. This channel is here to provide educational presentations on firearm and firearm accessories. Nothing more, nothing less. With that out of the way, let's get into a technical analysis of these sites, starting with their intended application. These are extremely similar products, and for that reason, I will generally be discussing these units as interchangeable for the duration of this presentation. When it comes time to highlight the relatively minimal differences between these units, I will make those distinctions clear. Both units are rugged, simple-to-use reflex sites designed for military application, specifically general-purpose targeting on standard-issue Kalashnikov pattern rifles. To put it in American context, these products fill precisely the same niche as the M68 CCO or Close Combat Optic. Like the CCO, these collimators are highly functional and greatly increase the capabilities of their host weapon, offering the operator faster and more accurate targeting at all ranges and in all lighting conditions, at least compared to iron sights. Also like the CCO, these sights reflect fairly dated thinking as far as electro-optical design goes. Well, the clear trend among warfighters today is to mount microdot and open windowed holographic sights aggressively far forward on the weapon. Perched on increasingly comical riser systems, the PK and CCO systems were born in an era when designers hadn't envisioned red dots being used particularly differently than magnified scopes. Consequently, both PK optics are generously dimensioned and sit low and far back on the receiver. Now let's be clear, I'm not saying this is an insurmountable liability. In fact, I'm quite sympathetic to the old timey way of doing it. In a professional context, I stuck with the Aimpoint Comp M2, even when just about everyone around me had switched to EOTech 553s and LCANs. 
Now, mind you that the Comp M2 is still lighter and smaller than either of the PK series optics, and I certainly didn't run it as low or far back on the rifle as those optics would sit. But the point is that shooter preference is a real thing, and all that actually matters at the end of the day is the shooter's ability to put rounds on target as quickly as possible and under as many conditions as possible. The writing is on the wall that the PK-style optics are not the most efficient way to do that. However, they are still a viable solution. Any red dot is better than no red dot, and the performance gap between these two rifles is a lot smaller than the performance gap between these two rifles. So in summary, basically what we're dealing with is an early Eastern take on the service reflex optic and a spiritual sibling to the CCO, at least in concept. So let's stop talking about concepts and get into features. Both optics run on a single AA battery in sealed compartments, which I love. Personally, I'd like nothing more than for all tactical weapon enablers to run exclusively on AA batteries, but that's neither here nor there. The battery compartment on both units is located in the 7 o'clock position, so basically a mirror of the Aimpoint Comp M4S. Both units have easily accessible brightness control dials with eight brightness settings. The lowest settings are night vision compatible, however due to the position of the red dot on the rifle, I don't really see these as actually being practical for use under nods. The brightest settings are daylight bright, however sometimes only barely, which I will discuss at greater length when discussing the detractions of these optics. As previously stated, I've only owned these optics for about 18 months, so I cannot decisively comment on battery life. I have left them on for days and weeks on end, however, and I haven't had to replace batteries in either, so I do feel confident in claiming that battery life is somewhere between adequate and more than adequate. Given that they use the most universally sourceable battery pattern on the planet, any further distinction is academic, if you ask me. Both optics have integrated mounts, which are specific to the Kalashnikov-style side rail. The actual mounting surfaces are removable and replaceable, but the mounting arms are cast into the frames of the optics themselves, so they can't be readily converted for use on any non-Kalashnikov-type weapons. The mounts themselves are Belomo proprietary universal-style mounts, so they should interface with any pattern of Kalashnikov-style side rail, including the SVD or Yugo style. That said, height over bore will vary depending on the pattern used. Installation and removal are extremely efficient once the mount has been properly tensioned for your rifle. Again, there are no provisions for adjustment once the optic has been mounted, so while the optic will be serviceable on virtually any rifle it's mounted to, it may sit a little bit left or a little bit right of the bore axis, or higher, lower, forward, or rearward of what you would optimally prefer. Both optics use a 1 MOA dot and are adjustable in half MOA increments. Both optics include removable rubber lens protectors for the objective and ocular lens, and while cheap feeling, they are functional and seem to have held up just fine. Lastly, the overall construction of both optics seems to be pretty good, or at least consistent with what one would expect from the crude but dependable Comblock mil specs. The lens coatings are good, and glare is a non-issue, and the material of the body appears to be the same magnesium alloy, which has been used in combat-proven designs such as the PSO-1. In summary, both optics are simple but functional. While they lack the elegance of Swedish machined aluminum, they seem to have all of the features that really matter, if perhaps not a whole lot else. All right, so now let's go ahead and take this opportunity to highlight the potentially noteworthy but overwhelmingly insignificant differences between these two units. The PK-01VS brightness adjustment dial is integrated into the battery compartment, aim point style. The battery feeds from the front of the optic with the dial on the rear. The PKA Venezuela feeds the battery from the rear of the battery compartment and has a separate brightness adjustment dial integrated into the mount. I've experienced no advantages or disadvantages to either setup, however the PKA design is theoretically more durable. The windage and elevation turrets on the PKA Venezuela are capped and finger adjustable, whereas on the PK-01VS they are exposed and require an improvised tool. Again, I've not experienced any advantage with either configuration, however the PKA is theoretically more rugged. In terms of really pedantic differences, the windage adjustment turrets on the two optics are mirrored. Additionally, the eighth brightness setting on the PK-01VS is labeled K, whereas on the PKA it is labeled 8. The only really substantial difference I can note between the PKA Venezuela and the PK-01VS is going to be their weight. On my scale, the PK-01VS weighs in at 15.4 ounces, whereas the PKA Venezuela comes in at 21.2 ounces. That means that both of these optics are very heavy, but the PKA exceptionally so. Much of that weight seems to be in the mounting arms, which are significantly beefier on the PKA. In the end, the differences between these two optics paint a pretty clear picture. They do the same thing, 
but the PKA offers greater theoretical durability, albeit at a weight penalty of 5.8 ounces. So let's move into the positive attributes of these two optic systems and talk about what I like about these optics. Honestly, my overall impression of both optics is in the end positive. I don't love them, but I like them and I like them because they work. Much like the AKs they're designed to be mounted on, neither optic can claim to be the slickest or most cutting edge innovation in war fighting, yet neither can they be dismissed as obsolete. They might not be the fastest to arrive at the destination, but they will ultimately get there. There, in this context, being modern combat effectiveness. I have used both sites in sub-freezing temperatures as well as rain, and I've knocked them pretty hard into barriers and pavement. I'm not Robski, I don't claim to be. I didn't formally and properly torture test these optics. However, I also didn't baby them, and I've used them in fairly adverse conditions. And none of those conditions have adversely affected performance in any way um, thus far. Repeated removal and reinstallation of the sights does not seem to affect combat zero. Um, super open to the possibility that if I cared, I would see slight um, roving shift on paper. I see no indication that these tiny shifts are cumulative, and they certainly are not making uh, the difference between effective hits and misses at steel torsos at appropriate combat ranges. Another perk of these optics is that they do allow for very low co-witness um, with the iron sights on most AKs that I've mounted them to. Given the quick detach feature of the mount, I don't see that being useful in maybe the traditional sense that we think of, but it does serve as a confidence um, boost to be able to just get that quick down and dirty zero check where you can just shift up uh, to the bottom of that site. If you've put that um, site back on and you're worried it got knocked around or you're worried that you know your buddy uh, cranked the dials on you, you can get that up and you can verify that indeed those sites are still co-witnessing pretty close and you know you're still in business. One additional feature on these optics that I really like is that they both feature double zero brightness dials, meaning they have offsettings at the maximum and minimum brightness. In other words, the dial goes from off to power settings one through eight to off again. Well, pretty minor, I do like this because it eliminates a step that I'm used to with aim points, which only zero at the bottom of the brightness settings, and usually require you to crank through the entire range of the dial, only to count clicks backwards in order to get to your desired setting. The PK eliminates this and allows you to just get straight to those clicks that matter. In summary, while the PK series optics that I've discussed in this presentation are by no means exceptional, the most positive thing that I can say about them is that they do successfully meet all of the basic and non-negotiable performance metrics of a combat red dot. And in many situations, that's all that matters. I don't think they're likely to be the best choice for many people, but then again, I don't think an AK is necessarily the best choice for many people either. When put together, however, they certainly constitute an acceptable choice, and that's a big deal. So now that I've established the fundamental viability of these optics, let me talk a little bit more about why I don't think they're ideal and why I personally have begun to move on to different um, solutions. First and most obvious is going to be size and weight. The PK-01VS is big and heavy. The PKA Venezuela is big and ridiculously heavy. While the performance of the optics is pretty solid, the performance to weight ratio of both optics is abysmal. As an example, here's a Western aftermarket solution, which in my test so far checks all of the same functional boxes as the PK series optics, yet weighs less than half as much as the PKA Venezuela, and is still more than a quarter pound lighter than the PK-01VS. Weight isn't the be-all end-all, and there is truth to the old drill sergeant adage that a rifle is only as heavy as you are weak, but when you can save weight, you probably should. And with these optics, you can definitely save weight. Next thing to talk about is going to be brightness. Let me be clear, I've never been in a lighting situation with either optic where I could not clearly see my red dot. However, I've been close. And I think that's noteworthy. Um, I was in a grasslands um, on a really, really bright day, and I was on max settings with both optics. And they were pretty much perfect in that condition. It was really, really bright, but I can't imagine a desert or like alpine steppe environment where it could theoretically be brighter and the dots at that point could be dimmer than you'd want them to be. I'm sure they'd be visible and usable still, but you don't want dimmer than you need. Um, so again, we're not talking about a kind of like fight stopping deficiency, so to speak, but I don't like maxing out the capabilities on any weapon system or any weapon system and enabler. It always feels better to know that I've got more adjustment range if I need it. So it is a detraction in my book. 
So everything I've mentioned so far, I can totally live with. It's not great, but not terrible. There's one more detraction on these dots, which absolutely drives me crazy and is the closest thing that I would have to say is a fatal flaw with both designs. And that is the geometry of the mount tensioning lever. When installed on a rifle, the tensioning lever sticks out at about 30 degrees and makes the weapon absolutely miserable to carry when slung on the front of the body. Whether it's your belly, your chest, or in my case, right in the sternum, the weight of the rifle goes all into this sharp little point, and it's just awful. And before anyone points out, oh, well, that's not actually an issue if you're wearing body armor, it's actually way worse if you're wearing body armor, and I'm about to show you why. So what's usually on body armor? About a trillion well-reinforced nylon snag points. What do soldiers like to do when they're carrying a weapon all day? Find any way they can to get that weight off of their arms. If you've ever pulled one over on Drill Sergeant by hanging your M4 by the charging handle from a molly loop in your flick, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, ladies, gentlemen. Well, often forgotten, but not by me. Negligent discharges we've got. So what happens when this tensioning lever gets stuck on one of these reinforced nylon snag points? The fucking optic falls off. So yeah, that's my biggest gripe with the design and absolutely why moving forward, I'm gonna be going with systems like this, which keep me from having to choose between sternum torture and involuntary weapon disassembly. All right, everyone, so that's my video. I uh, hope it was helpful to at least some people out there. If you like this type of content and want to see more of it, please check out my other videos. And if you don't like this type of content and don't want to see more of it, then don't check out my other videos. If you have any specific questions about these optics, um, if you've had experiences of your own, I'd love to see those in the comments. If you want to talk about how the fact that I'm obviously looking up to read my script, please put that in the comments too. Always confidence boost. Otherwise, thanks for tuning in, and I hope to catch you in the next one. Involuntary torture test. Whoops. Oh, that was a good hit, too. Hollow Sun uh, 403R torture test, day one.